Greetings, hello, welcome everyone, welcome to Dev Chatter. My name is Brendan and I am the host of the Dev Chatter live stream uh, that you have decided to join today. Uh, if you are one of those people that is watching us in the future in a recording, hello person in the future, welcome, I hope everything is great there. Uh, so, let's go ahead and uh, I guess go through a bit of our intro. So, uh, if you're new here, welcome, feel free to uh, ask questions or just sit around watching in chat, either way is fine. Uh, as I said, my name is Brendan and we have an awesome community here. You'll find them in the chat. Uh, they're, you know, friendly. You'll see Crimson Green and SNB have already said hello. So greetings to both of you. Uh, if you are interested in communicating more with us, uh, a link to the Discord is shown up in chat and there are obviously links down below to everything. So GitHub link as well if you are interested. Uh, in checking those out. s &B, uh, we are waiting on um, Twitch to approve our emotes. So we have uh, new emotes that are coming in uh, that once they are approved, everyone will have access to those. Uh, so right now there are only two emotes available because Twitch uh, does not approve very quickly for uh, the affiliates, of which I am one. Uh, if you are wondering what those emotes will be, uh, I will put them on screen real fast. So these are the emotes that are going to be available once they get approved. So for anyone that is interested, if you are one of our subscribers here on the channel, uh, we are going to have our high emote where there's the little dinosaur holding up his uh, <laughs> extendo arm to say hello. Uh, we're going to have shock, love, and then uh, derp and think are already there. So. Uh, instead of having hype, we'll have high for a little while, and uh, I put fail and dance on there as well because, well, we have too many emotes and not enough slots, so uh, maybe eventually uh, we'll hit uh, Twitch Partner and unlock more slots, but until then, <laughs> I will be rotating them around, so right now there will not be a hype, but there are some other cool ones. Okay, so where were we? Uh, for anyone that has missed our previous streams, we are building an application in WPF using C Sharp, and this is in .NET Core 3. So what that means to you is that the application is running in .NET and is still a uh, is is running in .NET Core and is able to be a WPF application despite the fact that WPF used to require that you ran in .NET full framework. So we can now use the lighter weight, faster version of .NET, the new, basically, we can use cool new hotness on our uh, client UI application. So, what we've been building is an application that will integrate into both Twitch chat over there, so, hence the commands that we suggested people try running, like menu random, and uh, when you type that, that will trigger this application to do a couple of cool things inside of the game Final Fantasy 7. Now, I'm not planning on working on the integration part today. Hey, Copper Beardy, welcome! That is an awesome set of emotes. Uh, <laughs> that's like nearly all of the live coders. There's no, there's no, where's, where's the dev chip? <laughs> no, that is a, that is a ton of emotes. That is really impressive, Copper Beardy. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and open up the uh, let's go and open up the game that we're uh, messing with. <laughs> uh, Offlight X, greetings, hello, and yeah, Copper Beardy. The uh, the funny thing is, uh, I was actually having a conversation with someone about that yesterday. Uh, someone that I used to be subscribed to, and I'm not anymore uh, because I'm like, no, I rotate my subs around, so like not the same people get them all the time, uh, so. They shift around. There are a few people that do get them all the time. Uh, hang on, off light X. Just give me a second. I'm loading up a game. I will. I will show you what it is as soon as we can make it run. Uh, so I'm planning on working on the uh, uh, some of the application. We're going to be setting up pages, looking at structure and things like that. So we'll be doing some uh, WPF XAML work today. Uh, probably some interesting things with binding and 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 layout. Uh, so if you are not someone that has worked with XAML. Uh, this will be useful if you're going to build any Windows uh, apps at any point or just want to see how it's done. 
Um, so this will be very different from how like win forms works, for example, but it'll be very similar to WPF and UWP stuff that you build. And if you go back in time, you can use some of this for Silverlight as well. <laughs> uh, that was obviously a joke. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and connect in there, and the game is running. So this is Final Fantasy VII right here. And that message... There's no... Uh, no, 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 no. We, we, we try to keep the swearing to a minimum. Oh, wow, off light. <laughs> I'm not used to the colors being able to change on this screen, by the way. I don't think anybody is. Because normally in the game, you cannot change the, the, the menus at this point. So that's pretty hilarious. Yep. Yeah. Uh, hey, DXWO, welcome. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so there's there's Menu Crimson uh, and SNB Rainbow Dust. Thanks, SNB. <laughs> SNB basically just shut everybody down. He's like, nope, we're going straight to Rainbow. Uh, so this is Rainbow Mode. Uh, these, so these are the types of things that we're building into our application, is ways for chat to get involved. And some of that include the ability to control what's happening with menu color. Some of those things are, uh, for example, naming characters. So uh, if you are a fan of this game and you want to rename Cloud, for example, you might go something like that. Uh, wait. Oh, it was already the top one. Oh, I7, um, what do I want to do with this one? Um, okay, Cloud's name is now Cloud. Now it's Brendan. And you can just rename the characters, and you have that control within chat, and uh, our subscribers actually have the ability to change these names right now. Um... So, essentially the 5,000 that I typed in would be an amount of gill that I want to put into bidding for the name uh, Offlight. Uh, and you can actually check your gill balance. Uh, um, oh, there we go. Uh, so I have uh, 150 gill, SNB has 150 gill. Um, <laughs> yeah, hey Wheat Lol, it is solid Saturday. Uh, so, yes. Uh, <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, offlight. So, uh, subscribers in a channel can get an amount of gill just automatically, and that is on our settings page, which our settings page is kind of nasty right now. This is the settings page. It just has a bunch of stuff just cluttered on here, um, and it works, but what I want to do is I want to change this to be a uh, tabbed screen itself uh, full of settings. So, that's the, uh, that's the idea here. So, a streamer can set an amount of uh, gill, which is basically, this is bonus bits for subscribers. So the point of this is a streamer might want to be able to make a little bit of money while they stream a game. So lots of people are full-time streamers. Uh, like the, There are plenty of people that their day job is playing games on Twitch. And uh, any way that you, know, you can make it so that um, there's some kind of reward or incentive uh, for people to support that streamer, I think you should do it. And so that's essentially what this is. It's a way to, you know, give the community something when they support their favorite Final Fantasy VII streamer, of which there are plenty of people that play this game. And I think it's kind of a fun little uh, application that we're doing here. Uh, so you'll see Rainbow Mode is still going, so SNB triggered this a while ago. Uh, but welcome, glad to see all the friendly faces in chat. So let's see what we can do to clean this up a little bit, make this a little bit nicer. So first off, I'm going to stop the program, which of course is going to mean that we're stuck with this color. That's really ugly. I should have changed the color before I did that. Uh, yeah, that's bad. Um, there we go. Uh, so you see how slow this process is of changing the colors? 
This was the only way to change the colors back in the day. There we go. So that doesn't look bad. That's see, that's a pretty nice color palette right there. Uh, so if you grab that and built that, uh, that would be that'd be a reasonable palette. I think a lot of people would like to play the game with that set. Okay, so let's jump over to our code because that's really what we're going to be doing today. Uh, we need to be able to change the color of the settings app. Uh, S and B. I I mean I kind of agree. Uh, that would be really cool. Uh, but no, we're not planning on doing that just now. Okay, so where was I? I am right here, and let's go ahead and start adding some things. So first off, let's create our song. I'm going to make a new branch real fast, uh, and we're going to branch off of that branch, and we're going to call it um, um, yeah, sorry, I, I can't, uh, oh, I can move the window, okay, um, what do I want to call this, um, settings, uh, screen. All right, so we're going to be working on the settings screen. So I'm just going to make a branch where I'm working on that. Uh, bring my changes in, please. So we'll keep our local changes. And this is the code that we're going to work on. So here's our XAML. Uh, wheat lol. Uh, it would work if the program was was running. Uh, yeah, yeah, so menu stuff works only when the game is running. Okay. Uh, so, here we go. This is the tab for settings right here. So, that's the about page. Uh, this one is settings. So, should say settings right there. Okay. Great. So once we're inside of the settings page, we want to do something. So if we look at this, at the design screen, this is the settings page, and it just has a whole bunch of settings on here, but I kind of want to make the settings be tabbed as well. So we're just going to do, uh, I mean, it's not like super nice interface, but for Battleship Gray, I think it's going to work, and I think it'll be easy to use. So let's put a tab control inside of our tab control. So the first thing I want to do is I figure the tab control inside of here should just take the whole space and then the tabs inside of them should scroll. And so for that, what that tells me is that I don't want to use this scroll viewer here. I want to actually just put the tab control on here. So first things first, let's um, go inside of the dot. Well, Let's get rid of the scroll viewer. So we're going to chop the scroll viewer out of here. Now we have a dock panel inside of a, a uh, tab item. This wrap panel is what we want to change. So the wrap panel is no longer going to be a wrap panel. So right now we have it so each block of settings sort of just wraps around and you can think like, you know, it's horizontal wrapping. As it doesn't fit, it goes down to the next level. So I'm going to get rid of orientation horizontal. And I'm instead going to make this a tab control. Okay, and that should have renamed the lower part, which I'm just going to go down and confirm. It did. Okay. So now inside of this, I want to wrap each one of those in a, uh, a tab um, item. So uh, yeah, it's tab control and tab item, right? There it is. Mike, why aren't I getting IntelliSense on this? OK, and then inside of that, we can put a tab header uh, and this is going to be, let's find out. What is this? General settings. So general settings will be the first one. So we'll just call it general. And actually, let's just cut the, the symbols. We won't have symbols on this one. So this will be general. And this is going to have a scroll viewer. 
So we'll have a scroll viewer here. So that means that this will be able to scroll and we'll put it right in here. Collapse the scroll viewer and we're gonna put it inside of the tab item. So now we have a tab item here and that tab item is our general settings. Now we need to do that piece again. So actually I should pull this out for a second. Put it out there because this is the piece we're copying a bunch of times. So I'm going to get this onto my clipboard and save this because I want that code again. Okay. Now let's go forward again. All right. So there is our first tab item. And I'm going to grab this code, paste it in here again. So this gets us our next one. So what is our next section? This is Twitch. So Twitch settings goes here. Uh, whoops, scroll viewer, there we go, and next one is going to go here, this one is going to be uh, menu color, so this is the menu color settings, so actually I'm realizing I should have the scroll viewer as part of the code that I am copy pasting in here because that actually makes the most sense. So let me save that. That'll make this a little bit faster each time. So now we take that, we put it in there, and we are on to the next tab item. Alright. Not too shabby. Uh, I find working with XAML to be a bit of a pain. Uh, oh, s and I totally agree. <laughs> I don't agree with the spelling of color. There's uh, um, SMB. Do you know the Do you know the uh, the joke about that one? Do you know why uh, Americans spell color and uh, other words like that without the U? It's because uh, the uh, Revolutionary War was all about getting rid of you. Oh, zing! <laughs> No, I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense, but yeah. <laughs> Glad people like the, the terrible... Oh yeah, it's an awful joke. <laughs> Luckily, it's long enough ago that, uh, that, that it's also not like a, a horrifying joke to make. In that... Uh, it's been a long time, because uh, wars are bloody, so you don't really want to, you know, make too much joke about wars and things like that. But... That's also not exactly a, a recent one. So, if you can't get to the point of being able to make jokes about stuff uh, with uh, other countries, then uh, I don't even know what you're doing. Alrighty, there we go. So that should be a whole new set of these. This one needs to get the name of status effects. So that's the status effects section. Uh, collapse that. Oh, that's funny. I still have those in there. Uh, this one is... Ooh, what is this one? Uh, equipment. Somewhere in here I should have had battle settings too. Uh, wait. This is battle settings. What did I call it? Status of... Oh, right! Status of X is battle settings. Never mind. I can remember these things. Uh, this is commands. Okay. That looks like it's it. Yeah.
couple of spaces between each one um, just so they're easier to find all right part of the problem with XAML is formatting it's a big pain um, do I know Michael McIntyre? Uh, wait, lol. Um, name's not familiar, so maybe. <laughs> and uh, thanks for the tomatoes, Copper Beardy. I don't, I don't have a tomatoes command on here. Uh, we're still fuming about. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you are, S and B. I'm, I'm sure. Yes. All right. Uh, there is derp. Yes, there's derp. All right, let's take a look and see what we get over here. We're going to run the application, have a look at how it looks, but I think that should have gotten us a set of tabs. Uh, so if you didn't see the, the code for that, it's basically just tab control. We put in a tab item, specify the header. Uh, whoops, wrong page. This one, okay. So now we have these sub-tabs to go from general, twitch, to menu, command. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's that's actually not bad. I don't like the border being around them anymore. I think that's a little weird. Because we had the border at first because uh, we kind of needed it. We don't even really need the header anymore. So there's a little bit of cleanup, but I do, I do like it. Um, he also explained the differences between British English and American English. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I would not be surprised if there was a comedian that made a lot of jokes about those. Uh, I'm sure there are a million of them. Because you can make a lot of funny things about the differences. They're really not that... They're not all that different, to be honest. Alright, so our dock panels moved out there directly into the scroll viewer. There we go. And then we can open up this one, do the same thing, which actually I'm just going to do that. Bonk. All right. Open up the scroll viewer again. Remove the border. Collapse the dock panel. Remove the other border. And shift it over. Uh, if you don't know, control, uh, you, you can hold shift and tab to remove, to like remove tabs from, uh, from this stuff. So that's all I'm doing. And one of the other cool tricks that a lot of people don't uh, know is uh, you'll notice when I click on a line number, it actually highlights the whole line. So it's a really convenient way of doing a lot of stuff. Um, uh, ALSH, uh, welcome. Thanks for that follow. Much appreciated. Welcome to Dev Chatter. Okay, uh, now down in this one. Uh, so these widths that we've got set on the dock panel, I think those are going to disappear as well, which is going to be really nice. So a lot of this code is cleaning up as we do this. Uh, our initial version was just I cobbled something together so we would have a setting screen at all. Uh, but I think there are a lot of nice improvements that we can make here, especially to our... I'm going to need to look at those. Did I nuke a data context and not realize it? Hang on. Let me just back up here. Oh, I shouldn't have backed up. Well, uh, we're just going to wait for Visual Studio a second to do its thing. I think it's the undoing of the tabs that's getting me. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, so... Uh, I'm just going to re redo, and we'll put back any of the ones that were on the tabs that I messed up. Alright. So that data context moves on to the dock panel instead of being on the border. <clears throat> Why I put the data context on the border on some of these, I don't know. I was apparently being crazy uh, when I put some of these together. Yeah, see? There's the data context. That should be on the dock panel, because that makes way more sense than the border. But I guess I was originally expecting the border to be the container of them, and I didn't care how it was laid out as long as it was inside the border. Uh, so right now, that sounds to me like I should be putting that on the tab item, then, instead of on the dock panel. So I'm going to do that. We're going to put it on the tab item. 
So the interesting thing about the way that um, data binding works in XAML, if you're not familiar, um, essentially within any given area, you can define what the data context is. When you do that, that becomes what you bind against. So when I say that my data context is the battle settings, that means that lower, so inside of that, anytime I do another binding like this one, the binding is affecting the data context. So allow status effects is a property on battle settings. So you can always just look up to whatever your, your you know, whatever the, the most recent data context is that you've received as you go up the stack, that's the one that's going to apply. So that's just sort of how that works. So if you're not familiar with that, congratulations. Now, now you sort of are. And it actually works pretty nicely because it does allow you to, at any point, define any other one that you could access. Yep, so our tab items having that actually is quite convenient. This is command settings. Alright, uh, so let me quickly find out. If I go in here, what's command settings called? It's just called command settings. Okay, cool. So data context, and in here we're going to say binding and command settings. So that now fixes this uh, data context that I removed. So that one's been fixed. And then on this one we have the same problem. This one is for name bid settings. So I need to find out what that one's called. And it is called name bid settings. Uh, hang on, I see someone said something in chat and I will have a look at that in a second. Um, need more containers. Um, potentially, yeah. Uh, on tab item makes more sense. This page displays item related to blank can be anything. Exactly, Renee. I, yep, I totally agree. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really appreciate the confirmation because, yes, it felt to me like these should go on the tabs. So I'm glad <laughs> glad you agree with me. Definitely feels like it goes on the tabs. Uh, comes with an added bonus that um, the, the tabs actually, um, when I collapse them, now have which, which one they are. So that's convenient, too. Data context. And this is binding menu settings so there we go very nice uh emmanuel welcome thanks for that follow much appreciated uh where does this one go that is twitch settings i can almost guarantee it's twitch settings yes data context and this will be binding and that and for anyone that doesn't actually know so this is the simple way of writing the binding i could technically write this i could say path equals and, and this is really the formal way of writing this, which actually gets me three separate colors. And if I needed to define like, you know, any other attributes, I can do them like this. So um, I can define fallback values, modes, other things. There's a whole bunch of properties that we can set. Uh, when I'm just doing a simple data context binding like this, I don't bother writing the path because um, it's really the display of a value in a control that uses it where I'm gonna want to do stuff like mode. And it's when I use those that I add the path in there as well. This should be the general settings, uh, which I think doesn't get a binding, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, SMB, just do what Crimson does and just trigger this. Uh, that, would, that would work well. Uh, next step will be data templating to get the controls to use... Um, the controls uh yes yes so we do need to actually template the controls in there because right now it's just sort of like there and a lot of copy pasted uh so we do need to clean up a lot of that stuff <laughs> use t4 for that uh thanks to be honest i'm actually tempted to do this i'm tempted to do that and and let me explain why um so in our app settings, we don't have, there is no general settings, they're just on the settings. And so what that means is 
that I want to have it consistent and show that intentionally we're not using one here. So I can see that they all have a binding and this happens to be the parent binding. Um, so, uh, you, you SNB, that is awesome. I would, I would love to see how to do that. Uh, like what exactly we should T4 this thing. Uh, but fuel stable's not here, so we can't. Fuel stable would kill us if we did that. Uh, and, and he wasn't here. Okay, let's have a look. Let's see what we got. Always run your programs. If you're one of the, uh, the newer, uh, programmers that are on our stream, because we do get a reasonable number of people who are, uh, beginner programmers that join us, always run your code. Just run it, take a look at, uh, at how it, how it goes. It's super, super important. Just run it. So that goes into the middle when we expand out. So like it does not give us any extra space, but I mean we can we can expand this. So how's this do when we shrink it down? Does it hold us? Yeah. So we can't go any smaller than this. So they kind of bounce around. They're not they're not displayed the best. I feel like maybe we should anchor them to the left the whole time so that if you are like this. They're not in the middle, so they don't jump quite as much. Um, but we could also make them flow a little bit more, so they take whatever space you've got for things like this one. Because the status effect, we could use that space much better now that it's inside of that tab. We could we could get much better uh, display of that. Uh, you just tried to summon Fuel Snable. Uh, what did you do? Did you, like, burn all the ones into zeros or something like that, SNB? That might be how you summon him. Uh, and I don't for, uh, and Crimson Green, I don't unit test my XAML. <laughs> what are you even talking about? Uh, hey, Mr. Shoji, welcome. Glad, glad you made the stream. Uh, we are making some improvements here. Um, one thing I did, I should mention to Mr. Shoji, um, I am now spinning up, um, uh, uh, the Seng, uh, like, monitoring aspect and the new overlay, um, oh, oh, you were in reference to my comment, yes, Crimson Green is correct, um, if you are a beginner programmer, Please learn how to unit test. You will be so thankful that you did and make sure you unit test your code because it really is a wonderful way to like figure out whether or not your stuff's working. So like in order to get a UI thing to confirm that it's working, really the only way to do it is like and actually see it and make decisions on it is to run it. So that's why you need to be running it constantly. If you're doing something where it can auto update, like if you're doing web dev, uh, you can do that and it's fantastic. Uh, but for any kind of a, if you're doing a console application or a GUI application locally, yes, just go ahead and just run it. Like so often I'll see people, especially when they're, when like, when people talk about like, oh yeah, I was doing this programming thing for this and I really messed it up. I was in my interview and I didn't do this right. And it's like, okay, how frequently were you running the code? Because like, seriously, just run the code all the time. It'll, it, it'll work. Also, oh my, ah, oh, I forgot to tell you, everyone in chat. Um, Copper Beardy, what's your favorite color? Just type it in chat. Just type in your favorite color. Is is your favorite color? Um, bl it's blue. Okay, good. Thank you, Copper Beardy. I'm glad to know it's blue. Uh, okay, so we're gonna, uh, this is an easy change. No need to really test. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly, Renee. Yeah, we we all do that one. Uh, like without without just running it. Uh, is that seriously crimson? That might be crimson. That's hard to tell for me because I'm looking at a small preview of that. Uh, periwinkle? Oh, we might get periwinkle. That might be one of the colors. Um, uh, whoops. If you like cyan, we can definitely do cyan. So there's, there's cyan. Yep. So I don't know if you noticed, but the uh, the colors of the uh, overlay on our stream change if all you type in is a color name. Okay, so I'm thinking we need to make all this stuff flow a little bit better. So don't restrict it quite so much. Let it go wherever it wants to go. 
Uh, but maybe let it let it go wherever it wants to go, but anchor it to the left. Uh, so I'm thinking a, a horizontal alignment stretch might be in order for the top part of it. We'll see. <laughs> Crimson green. Light green. Ooh, yeah, light green's not bad. Actually, lime green probably works out well. So if you just do lime, I bet that's actually pretty good. So there's lime. Should be super bright, yeah. So that actually doesn't look bad as like a highlight around a stream. So I really think that's a good one. Okay, so let's have a look. So our scroll viewer could be what takes up the whole space. Could be this. Uh, either way, let's get rid of the width and see what happens with it. Maybe it'll just automatically go to that. We'll just remove all the widths. Because we need to get rid of the width anyway. We don't want to... We don't want to hold that. The width was when we were going to have these all, like, grouped together. And with a screen all to themselves each time, they don't need a uh, limiting width. That was so that they could sit side by side nicely. I just set them all to 500 so they would flow together. There are more advanced ways that we could do that uh, instead of just picking a size, but that was a good, like, get it working today kind of answer. So, all right, let's see what it looks like. Uh, brown? Brown probably doesn't look terrible, actually, uh, because you probably can't even really tell that it is brown. Uh, yellow's pretty good. Uh, probably clashes with all the rest of the colors on my stream, but yellow looks nice on here. Okay, let's have a look at the settings page. There it is. Is it anchored to the left? Yes! Hey, we did it! Whoa, this one, this one looks bad. Okay, so this one messed up from that, uh, but <laughs> the other ones actually look okay. And I kind of want to get rid of their headings then, too, because uh, that no longer makes sense. But before we do that, I am going to commit this change. Uh, so move uh, settings uh, to tabs from, um, yeah, um, Move settings sections to sub tab, uh, sub tab each. Why did I, why did I capital letter these? I have no idea. I don't know why I do things. They just sort of happen. Horcrine, welcome, you made it. It has been a long time, welcome to the stream. Uh, you found out that you can use sections in partial, you can't use sections in partials if you have uh, a layout with a body page inside it, it will render section scripts. You can't use sections and partials? Um, I didn't know that, actually. Um, if you made a partial, it will not allow you to use the section scripts, so you likely can't use things like jQuery and partials because it doesn't load jQuery until the end. Um, I think, so at runtime, it would still be there, so it should be there still, Horcrine, I think? Maybe? Uh, Crimson Green, the color you might have been looking for might have been this one? I don't know, is that the name of the color? No, that's not it. Well, either way, we can always just do this. White. But I think I'd rather go with orange. It says that dollar sign is not defined. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know, Horkrine. Uh, something to look at. Alright, so we were going to hop in here and remove the... We're gonna remove the dot, the the dot, the the top docked uh, title from each one of these. 
is what we were thinking. Remove the titles, because it's going to be on the on the uh, on the tab name anyway. So it seems kind of redundant to display it here as well. And the more settings we can get on the screen and still have some nice white space, probably the better. Doing pretty well, Horkrain. Oh, you're going to the fair. Well, have fun, Crimson. Yeah, that's not bad. Okay, we need to fix status effects. General menu. Some of these we could maybe even use the space a little bit better. So, like, realistically, the app should be running like this, and this looks fine. But status effects gets bad when you expand, so we need to fix that one. But the other ones look good. So that's why we, we expanded out to that side, was to see, did anything get really messed up when we do that? Yeah, it should be a... a the state fair should be a, a pretty nice one. So have have fun. Uh, and uh, SMB, thank you for the magenta. It is, it is quite lovely. Uh, let's see, Rem remove uh, settings, tab, headers. Alright, so now that the headers are removed, let's go fix the status effects section. Because it's displaying weird, and I don't actually know why, because I'm not sure what it's doing. So let's have a look. Uh, what is it? It is a dock panel. So, it's a dock panel. It has an items control and a grid. And... The items control is on the bottom. The grid is... You know what? Let's put the grid... Let's anchor the grid to the top. So we'll put the grid on the top, because it is on the top, first off. We'll remove this one's uh, bottom docking, and we'll make it the middle dock, technically. Now let's have a quick look at what this did. Now, I think it's the fact that I just told these to just take as much space as they need. They, oh, wow, that fixes it. So docking it to the top instead of telling it to take all the center space uh, made this work perfectly. So look at that. As you expand out, it makes space for more of them. That is exactly what we want to see. Look at that. Hey. There we go. So now if you enable status effects, you can choose which status effects you want to have on and which ones you want to have off. Very nice. Excellent. Doo doo. Uh, so this is <clears throat> fixed status effect uh, settings layout. I'm gonna make sure I'm pushing these up to GitHub. Okay, so uh, that actually is the main thing I wanted to get done in in that part was get those niced up a little bit. So. Since we're working inside the settings page, let's go ahead and see if there are any other settings that um, that we need to take a look at. Which actually, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take a look at our task list. So I know all of our regular people know that this is a thing, uh, but something I did in this application was I went and I said every time I had a thing that was like, okay, I need to eventually add this to the settings view, I just put a to-do at each one of those so that we remember to go and get it. Uh, so which ones do we have? So those are... Okay, so those are more command words. Alright. So command words for... Uh, let's see. So I'm going to check for palette and rainbow, mako... 
Let's, let's just confirm that they're definitely not there, and then we'll add them in. So let's run the screen. I know I could just look on the page, but I'd rather look at the actual app, because it's a little nicer. So when we look at the uh, commands page, I see Popper, actually. So Popper has one. Wasn't that one of the ones that had a thing? Oh, no, it didn't. Uh, but Materia and Item do. Are Materia and Item in here? Nope, they're not. So I just misremembered. misremembered. Uh, Mako is not in here. I don't see it. Okay, so Mako and Rainbow and Palette. So let's do Mako, Rainbow, and Palette right now, because I think that's going to be a set that will be useful to have. So Mako, Rainbow, and Palette. So we have the settings, they're just not displayed. So we're going to go into Command Settings for now. And yes, I know this is terrible, ugly, awful thing. So I said uh, Mako, Rainbow, and Palette. So we will do this. This becomes Mako uh, Rainbow and Palette. Oh man, do I need to uh, uh, fix those so palette, rainbow, and Mako. Yep, that's them. So that's those three. And this will be 21, 22, and 23. And that'll be 21, 22, and 23. Then we need to adjust their text because it is no longer that. It is Mako. and palette there we go now in theory when we run this we should see settings now for mako rainbow and palette assuming i didn't typo anything which i don't think i did settings command mako rainbow and palette and there they are and you'll see we already had the data in there because they were already in the settings, technically. Uh, so we were super friendly about this, if you didn't see. Uh, we made it so that, like, Mako mode, Rainbow mode, Rainbow, Palette, 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 and Palette. So I gave, like, four different typos uh, that you might have. Because we aren't doing, like, a, we, we are not doing a, a fuzzy search on these or anything like that. You do have to get one of the accepted commands. Um, but this makes it nice. I really should uh, adjust the commands to accept uh, color with a with a U as a as a valid uh, way of writing that. I think all the uh, British English speakers would appreciate it. I mean, technically, they can just add it into their own bot, and then it would just work. But it would be nicer if the bot just accepted those out the gate, because then no one actually has to do it themselves. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've been meaning to do it. So funny enough, uh, it, it's got to be, I need to put it in, I was originally going to put it in the color switcher when we were going to do the color switcher with a color command instead of just doing like this. Instead of just saying like, um, you know, navy, for example, and having the, the color just change. Uh, we were originally going to make you type color or something like that, but I was like, yeah, let's just make it so the word just does it. Now, the funny thing is, for anyone that's that's in here, and you've noticed that we've been doing the overlay changing thing, and you know you can you know put in whatever color you want, and it'll update the overlay to that color. Um, I should specify that you can actually do this. Um, so you can actually change the colors based on these as well. So there, there's a color. I don't know what color that is, um, but that's that's a color right there. 
So you just put in a uh, in a color. So whatever your favorite uh, hexadecimal color is, you know, maybe it's this. I don't know how ugly that's going to be, but let's see what it does. That should be reddish. Yeah, there you go. Reddish. Let's go with... Um... Oh, yeah, there we go. That's lovely. <laughs> so it's nice, because uh, you, you can get controls however you like. All right, so materia and items, is that the ones that are next? That's the only ones on this page? Okay, materia and items. Let's just add those in at the bottom again as well, and we can sort them later. So materia and items. Materia and items. Okay. Uh, materia, items, this is 24, 24, 25, uh, whoops, 25 and 25. And we're getting that squiggle because row 24 and 25 don't exist. So we'll duplicate those lines and now they do exist. And we'll run this one more time. And we should have now, uh, you want bad, I don't, I don't need bad colors, Renee. I'll take any, I'll take nice colors too. Like, you know, um, I don't know, uh, what's a good color, um, hot pink, yeah, hot pink wasn't a significant change from what we just had, um, but mango whips a color, right? Well, I thought it was, apparently not. Isn't that what it is? Maybe I'm wrong. Um, not orange is a color. Okay, so in the commands we now have... Ooh, items command. I didn't bind that correctly. Because the items command should have some defaults. See? That's why we check it. Is it item command? Yep, it's item, not items, plural. So here's one of the problems with XAML, is that, um, that XAML actually does, uh, so navy blue is actually just navy, Renee. It's actually just navy, funny enough. It's using the HTML names for them, so. Oh, there we go, violet. There's a nice one. Okay, uh, so so here's what we're going to do, because we could use the extra space, so we're going to make, uh, um, column one is auto, column two, oh, that's funny, I was about to change these so that these, so that this was an auto and a star, because I figured they were both auto, but no, they're, they're stars, so we need to make it so that this text box can take the full gap and this is why I should have been doing what I should have been doing the whole time um, because now I run into a problem and that is that my stupid text box thing that has a width defined on it if I if I change it now so I'm gonna take this I'm going to highlight all of it. I'm going to do a replace of that value with nothing inside of the selection and get rid of all of those. So that's now been removed for all of those. And this is why I should be using a styling on these. Uh, so you can actually define a styling inside of XAML and, and reuse it. And the styling will essentially give uh, all of these properties that you have on it will then just be reusable as a resource on them. So I should probably extract that out so that these all use it because there are 26 of them. 
and probably make it a little bit nicer for tweaking them. So I've now removed the, the width and I'm hoping that it'll just expand to take the full space now. Um, no, it took the amount of space that it had. Uh, oh, it expands based on what you type in there. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's how text boxes work. <laughs> uh, cool. No, not what we want. Um, okay. So let's put that back. Um, let's go to the top one again. So we know we can do that replacement pretty easily. So we're going to do the same thing. Um, so this is... Uh, no. Um... Ooh, uh, actually, I'm just going to Google that one real fast. Um... Oh, it's Fuel Snable! Everyone, look! Look, it's Fuel Snable! The summoning worked! The summoning worked! You win, s &B. <laughs> Is it with Phil? Um... Yeah, this. Uh, wait. Um, yeah, this is what I want. You know, I did not mean to click on that ad. Give me... Oh, you... Get out of here. I did not click on that. You lie... Okay, I sort of did. But you, you lie. I didn't mean to. Um, with auto. Uh, auto? Auto? Could be, could be stretch? I don't know. Um, oh, fuel snivel, that is true. I didn't think about that. Um, we, we could do that. Uh, for when we're doing, for all these ones that get a converter, we could make a binding that just gives you that one for the for the special command word binding. Um, yeah, so the funny thing is, Fuel Stable, I also used to use WPF a long time ago, and I'm re-remembering all of this stuff, so... Um, Let's let's try auto and see what it does. If that fills the space, then cool, we'll go with it. But auto seems like that's the default because auto normally means auto like go to the width of the thing that you're doing. Yeah, see that auto is what it does if we don't specify. Um, it doesn't like fill. Yeah, it doesn't like stretch or anything either. So... Yeah, text box with auto didn't do it. Um, yeah, so they're putting it inside of a dock panel. Which can work, um... Yeah, my text box isn't a grid. It doesn't expand to take that space, though. Um... Can I with star it? I don't think a text box can with star, but I'll, I'll try it and see what it does. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the problem is a text box doesn't have horizontal alignment. Uh, it has horizontal content alignment, which is, yeah, okay, it doesn't like it. Um, <laughs> that was easy. Um, so we can try that, but I'm not sure if that's going to do it either. So let's find out. We'll, we'll try stretching it out, see what it does. Horizontal content alignment stretch. If we can get that working, then we can stretch these to take up the full space, give them a little bit of margin on the right. No, that didn't do it either. That's just making the content on the inside stretch to the space, which of course it would do anyway. Well, we technically could dock panel it, but I really don't want to dock panel it, because that gets really nasty. Uh, if we're going to dock panel every one of those. Um... You could stack panel it too. Um, well, the parent, we know what the parent element is. It's this grid that we're in. And the grid is taking the whole space. We just need this to expand out to it. There's a column definition right here. One's auto, one's star. So the columns, so it's taken up the full spot here. Let me show you. We'll open it up. So for anyone that doesn't know, there is actually a little uh, viewer inside of uh, the WPF app. That's what this little thingy is on the top that you've probably seen. There's a little chiclet up here. Uh, yeah, so we've got this right here. That can actually let us take a look at some of this. So. You can actually see this is the this is the grid that this is in. So there's the content, there's the text box, and that's the grid. So the grid's taking the whole space. Cause with my cursor between these items, it does the, the whole grid. So uh, funny enough, Fuel Snable it is actually in uh, in Git now. Uh, but this one's in a branch because we just did it today. Okay, either way, let's close that. Uh, I'd create a template if you're in a grid, can't you dock fill? Uh, is there a way to fill in a grid? Uh, but we're not inside, but there's no dock, right? Right, like what would we, what would we fill? See, um, yeah, that one just doesn't work. We're in it. I mean, like, yeah, the, you suggest use a grid, but that doesn't fill it because that's what we're doing. That's what we have right now.
Well, let's try putting a dock panel around it. Um, and we'll just see what happens to it. Oh, yeah, Renee, yeah. In in uh, in wind forms, yes, you are correct. You can absolutely do that in wind forms. So let's do this. So if we put it in here, then these become irrelevant. Left, top, right, um, and none on the bottom, I guess, and we'll see how that looks. Uh, why don't you put the text box in grid column one instead of zero if you want it to uh, stretch all with uh, it should be in grid column It is in grid column one So uh, it's a very very good suggestion, but yeah, it is doing that so No, even that didn't take up the space so even putting it inside of the dock panel did not actually make it take up the full space So dock panel last you know Fill didn't didn't do anything. Dock panel dot dock. Yeah, should take the whole space, but doesn't. All right, well we're gonna pull out the dock panel then. I'm just gonna back it up, and we'll uh, add back in the grid row. Uh, so how do we make that thing fill then? Um, let's ask a different person on the internet. Yes, exactly. Yes, this, this, this is what we're doing. That is perfectly shown. I want to fill that in my grid. But I don't have horizontal alignment. Oh my god, I did. And it, it just wasn't showing it to me because it was here. Derp, 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 derp. Derp and derp, 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 derp. I was like, but it doesn't have it. And that's because it wouldn't show it to me because it was already there. Which was the first thing we tried. So, turns out the first thing we tried was right. And it just wouldn't let us do it because we couldn't see that because there's too much stuff on the page to begin with. 25 occurrences of that. Left has become stretch. And uh, welcome. Now, now it works. So if it doesn't work this time, I'll be terribly surprised. So... Um, if you're new, uh, we have a very welcoming community. It's a very nice group. Lots of friendly people. Uh, wait. The top one did it. Did the other ones not? Oh, they still have their width. That's why. Yep, they still have a width. Because we removed it from the first one, but not the other ones. Alrighty, let's go ahead and just highlight that. Control H, put in the width, and we are replacing that with nothing. And we'll run this. So here we go. Hey, hey, welcome, Paulina. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so we need a little bit more margin on the right uh, so that we're not all the way to the end uh, because you see we're like right up against that scroll bar there. But it does seem to work because I think we have our margin set to zero pixels right now. So let's find out. Uh, 
Okay, how do I tell these apart? I tell them apart by doing this. Alright, and... So on the right hand side we're gonna make it 10 pixels. Uh, I need to make a template for this, but I haven't yet. I really need to, from current document to selection, replace all of those, please. 26 occurrences is the correct number of occurrences. Run that. Uh, create an items control and generate the rows dynamically from models. Uh, fuel snivel, yeah, we can potentially do that. The challenge there is that we then need to create a collection of them, which is a little weird. But yes, we could make a collection uh, and, and bind them based on that, which is how we do a lot of our other properties in here. Uh, but we don't do it on this one. But yeah, there we go. So that actually looks pretty nice. But yeah, if we do it with a collection-based approach and do this with an items control, then that would probably solve this nicely. Um, how do you use a grid in an items control? I haven't thought about that one, actually. Because I like having this lined up where they all start at the same point. Because this looks nice at this at this scale right here gets a little big as you as you expand out but I think it looks nice that that's totally usable so if you had a little bit of extra space you can you can expand this to add your additional words if you're gonna use them <clears throat> but that gets us a good uh, v1 of this uh, let's hop over to command settings again and so the item command uh, words is there and so is the materia okay uh, so that is um, display um, missing command uh, words settings. So those were the command word settings that we did not currently have displayed. They are there. Do do do. Um, I actually kind of want to look that up. Internet, answer my question. Let's go, Internet. Uh, my question is uh, WPF items control grid. Yeah, using a grid as the panel for an items control. Yep, how's that work? Uh, you say grid and you say data template. Does it just know how to do it or something? Whoa, 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 no, we're not, what? No, I don't know what that is, but no. Um. How do you use a grid? <laughs> how do, yeah. Uh. Yeah, no, dude, no. No, no, I'm not taking that approach. I'm not, like, this is not web forms. Uh, okay, so... Content presented this, what, what is going on here? Yeah, this. Uh, you need some way to tell the grid how many rows and columns it has. Perhaps as each item loads, you could... Yeah, see, that is the problem. Uh... Bind row count and column count properties? Oh, that actually could work, potentially, but that's weird. Um... That's also weird. Yeah, so I don't think there's a way to do it. 
uh, just based on that, unless you set a specific width for the column, if you set it instead of making it able to adjust based on, on the actual needs of your content, um, I can't see a way to do it without getting some really weird code. Either way, um, we have that committed, so let's take a look at our task list, uh, task list again. Uh, rainbow command. Needs configurable time. I agree it does. Okay, so let's figure this out. So, um, the rainbow command, and actually I'm going to show the rainbow command again because a lot of people haven't seen it. So let's turn on the rainbow command for a second. We're going to add a configurable time to this. And uh, the reason why is because right now it just runs for a hundred iterations, which is literally like five minutes. So I don't remember exactly how long it is, but it is quite a while. So that's now in chat. So chat now actually has control of the menu color. So you can do uh, menu random and it updates the menu colors like this. So you could do menu default and it goes back to the, the classic Final Fantasy VII menu. Uh, you could do, uh, we have some color palettes in here, like that one is the Brendan color palette. Uh, then you've got random where it'll just pick random colors and you can actually queue up a sequence of them if I just toss those in there and it will start rotating into this. But we also have a couple of other special commands that are, um, the rainbow command triggers rainbow mode, and if I just say rainbow like that, it just starts going. And you can actually just watch as it will just change now for like five minutes. And we want to make that configurable so that like the amount of time that it runs is configurable and maybe even have a way to stop it, which we don't currently have a way to stop it. So, <laughs> um, either one would be useful. For now, let's make it configurable how long it runs. Uh, rename character. You just do the character's default name, so like Barrett, uh, and you'd say uh, S and B, and like like that. So Barrett's name is now S and B. Yep, that's all you do, so that's what we want to do is we want to make that configurable, so um, I don't have a good way to stop it, so let's hope that we end on a good color. So this would be the number of random iterations to go through. So this value needs to come from somewhere. Did one of these use a setting? That one's gonna need to. This one did not, but these are getting, uh, these have gotta be getting created by the IOC container which means we should be able to get any, we should be able, well, actually, we should just be able to access the settings. So let's just do this. Uh, private, um, application settings, um, settings, uh, application settings instance, like that. Um, so where should this value come from? Settings dot, I feel like this should be a menu setting because it's part of that. So there's rainbow mode cost. Um, so yeah, I was uh, I I apparently agree with myself. Um, so instead of cost, maybe it's uh, iterations. Um, 
Rainbow mode iterations. We'll say. So... Uh, is that a VS... Uh, I don't know, is it? No. Um, what version am I running? That's a good question. Hang on one second. I am running 16.3 Preview 1. Yeah, I'm on uh, I'm on 16.3 preview one S and B, so I am ahead of uh, wherever you think I am. Oh, that's fun! I already had a uh, added to the settings screen thing on here, which is perfect because we're gonna need to do that with this one also. Okay, so that is asking for a number of iterations. Uh, don't need that. Settings, menu settings, rainbow mode iterations. Yeah. <clears throat> You're using Netcore 3 with the RTM bits with no issues. Uh... Yeah, so you should be able to use it now with uh, with that. I th uh, because they did a go live license on it, uh, S and B. Um, which, so I guess I could stop using the preview now. Um, but there's also C sharp eight, uh, which I don't know whether or not um, the most recent version, what version of C sharp eight is built into that one, like what it's gonna run with. So the previews get me all the latest and greatest stuff. Um, Somebody that does coding in his spare time can get a job uh, without having an official graduation. Logical XX, yes, um, you absolutely can. Um, you're, I mean, the job you're going to get, they're going to be expecting a junior programmer, so the the pay will be a lot lower than than for like a, uh, um, you know, a more experienced programmer. But yes, you can get jobs in programming without having a degree in programming, uh, as long as you can get yourself in the door and uh, get yourself an interview so that you can prove to them you that you really do know how to code. Uh, my recommendation would be to uh, learn uh, unit testing and TDD and those sorts of things. Uh, and part of the reason why is that is going to make you stand out a little bit uh, among, you know, junior programmers. So it's, it's the same reason why a lot of boot camps make sure to teach that. Uh, I would also recommend uh, pick a tech stack and learn it really well and try to pick one that's like currently popular in your area uh, as that will increase your chances of getting the job. Uh, despite the fact that when hiring programmers it is not important to hire based on that kind of knowledge, but uh, for a junior it is easier if they already know the language. So uh, that would be the, the concept. Uh, TDD is test driven development. Uh, so it's the idea that you write unit tests before you write the code. Uh, so um, that, that's that's all that one is. Um, do you think somebody that does... Uh, wait, hang on. What MVVM and DI library are, am I using in this project? Um, that's actually a great question. Uh, so the MVVM stuff that we're using... So we are actually just using the default MVVM bindings in WPF. We're not using an additional framework to assist us with that. So it's raw MVVM. Um, we, so, you know, everything's just using a notify property changed. Uh, it's all home rolled. Uh, our DI container for this one is actually the ASP.NET built in IOC container. So, uh, if you've used the, like, Microsoft, um, you know, dependency injection, uh, libraries that come with .NET Core, uh, you'll find the ASP.NET Core ones initialize automatically. And in fact, in this project, uh, so... I have not been showing this up to this point, uh, but uh, let's see, having a degree does not make it easier to get a job. I know I got one and still not working. Um, I mean, the degree helps you get a job. The, the trick is getting in the door uh, to get yourself an interview. So 
copper beardy i don't know where you're looking for one but um because uh, I, don't, I don't know where people are based so you can absolutely get get a, a job in programming uh the 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 ways you get in the door are the tricky ones so uh in a lot of cases you want to go in through connections so uh if i know you and know that you know how to program and you wanted to come work for a company that I worked for. I don't currently work at a place where this would actually happen. Uh, but <laughs> the idea is, if I know someone's good, I get them an interview where I'm working. And I'm just like, here, bring them in. You know, this person's great. Okay, so people asked about the IOC container and everything like that. And that got me talking about how we have ASP.NET Core in this project. And I want to show you all something if you haven't seen this, it is really cool. So, right here, this is a website. I don't know if any of you, have you has, uh, has everyone here heard of like the World Wide Web and, and websites? It's this cool new tech. Um, what you do is you basically use a web browser. Um, this one is called Google Chrome. And this web browser actually connects to a computer to display this page and uh and back in all seriousness now though um the web server that is hosting this website that i am loading here is run inside of this wpf app so this wpf app when you start it kicks up a web server and that is actually what allows us to run this page now if anyone hasn't noticed yet um that actually is a cool little thing that I can show here, um, which is this. Oh, I didn't hit connect. Hang on, I didn't hit connect. Click. Let's go back to the uh, default color palette there. Oh, look at that. What is that? What? 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 Oh, man. That screen's refreshing with the random values that we... What? Whoa, that's crazy, man. Uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, if that really was the World Wide Web, it would be text only. <laughs> yes, I was I was making a joke, s and uh, Let's see. Uh, so, copyright UK, uh, but to be fair, you have a health problems that are an issue. Oh, okay. Because uh, I was going to say, like, the, I mean, they, there can be some, some weird circumstances. Um, uh, if, if that's the kind of, if that's the challenge you're running into Copper Beardy, I would recommend large companies. Because um, they, they tend to be easier ones to get through those doors on. So, this is called uh, Seng. This is the Seng overlay over here. And this is what this is. Why is that taking that extra space? We should fix that a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's that's the screen right there. That's uh... second picture. Oh, oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, Tifa will ac ab absolutely destroy anyone. That is uh, the 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 middle picture there. Uh, and uh, Fen, uh, welcome. Thanks for that follow. Much appreciated. Welcome to Dev Chatter. So, uh, just to prove to you, when I close this application, so if I close that, and we bring this page back up, um, and I try to refresh, you'll see that I just get connecting and boom. So, the site's no longer there because we closed our app, because it really was running inside of that WPF app. That's, that's where it was. Okay, so let's bring it back up because I want to try our setting because it should be in there to be honest. I pulled it up to, to show you this stuff, but our settings there, it should work. Uh, and if anyone is in here and hasn't yet uh, and you are enjoying the stream, be sure to click the follow button as it is the best way to get notified when we go live. Uh, and I need to go mess with the other bot. Let's connect this. Um, I did not actually give us a thing for this one. Yeah, so that's funny. This page just automatically reloaded when the site was available again. That's, that's good. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Ultra Lord. Yep. Uh, following the stream is actually a good thing because you can see the cool stuff we work on. Uh, let's see. We need to actually display this somewhere. So let's display this setting so I can actually modify it. So menu settings. And I need to do the same thing here because this one has has the exact same problem as all the others. Parsival, uh, thank you very much for the Twitch Prime sub. <laughs> yes, I know S and B. I know. I was actually going to fix that a minute ago. Uh, the the other bot. Uh, every once in a while, there's something that crashes. It. I think it's. Uh, I think it's failing at at a point that it used to fail at all the time, um, and we haven't fixed it. Uh, a lot of what it's actually doing is um, is going to go. Um, obsolete so uh, it's using a bunch of old uh, twitch calls and uh, we're calling like undocumented parts of their API so I'm not surprised if it crashes every once in a while uh, the applications just kind of kind of there right now uh, so I'm gonna try building it one more time and then uh, hopefully the bottle start up again because the other challenge is it also doesn't like to die there it goes. All right, so that's back now, and that's what SNB was trying to do. Oh, wait, hang on. Hang on, SNB. Oh, hey, it connected for you. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So the problem is, so this this screen that we're doing here uses the same overlay technology that this is designed to to do. Uh, essentially, what happens is we have a WebSocket connection with it, uh, but when the web server comes up, we're not immediately connected. So it's on a retry loop. And so it will eventually reconnect <clears throat> as soon as it can. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and copy that. <clears throat> also, Parsival, I should mention. So first off, thank you for subscribing. And uh, we do have some emotes in here. Uh, but uh, we will be having some more coming soon. So uh, I'm changing up our emotes right now. So these are the only two that are available today. Uh, but as soon as Twitch approves all the others, which I'm guessing they're going to do in a day or two, uh, then we will suddenly have, like, you know, three more emotes available to everyone on Tier 1, so should be good. Alright, let's, uh, let's go ahead and change this to 8, and what did we call that setting? Uh, I saw someone say something in chat, give me one second while I make these exist. Uh, and this is Rainbow Mode Iteration, ooh, I copied the wrong thing, I'm an idiot, hang on. Uh, I'm going to put those down here. So this is uh, Rainbow Mode Iterations and Rainbow Mode Cost. Rainbow Mode Cost and Rainbow Mode Iterations. All right, so this becomes uh, eight, eight, nine, and nine. Uh, we don't have a nine yet, but we will. And where is the rainbow mode like declaration? Where do I, where do I even specify enable rainbow mode? It's right here. I'm going to put this with them. So that's where we actually do rainbow mode. And this is... Uh, what determines whether or not those are on at all. Because they sh they'll disable if rainbow mode's not on. You'll see how that works in a second. Okay. Uh, Fen, uh, you were on Reddit and someone directed you to uh, the Discord uh, when you asked about learning more about C-Sharp. Oh, that's awesome. You're trying to learn C-Sharp. Welcome. Uh, we actually used to do a uh, series on here that was specifically about learning C-Sharp, uh, where we would be teaching people C-Sharp. Uh, do I have any recommendations about what you should learn um, after you know the basics? Uh, all the way up to about... So you know classes, arrays, and interfaces. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, my suggestion to you, uh, if you know those those basics, would be to build something. 
So the the challenge is you don't currently have uh, you likely don't have like the breadth of, of knowledge of what things are out there and available. And so my recommendation would be uh, choose an application and start building. Now you need to decide what type of thing you want to build in the long run. So that could be you want to be building web applications in C Sharp or you could say I want to build WPF applications or Windows applications or something like that. Or maybe you're just looking into programming and you might build a console application. No matter what it is, what you want to choose is choose something like a, a, a project to do that is either really interesting to you or one that is uh, useful to you in some fashion. So if, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe you're a D&D &D player, for example. Let's just, let's just go out on a limb. Maybe you're a D&D &D player. Uh, you could start off by building a, an application that tracks initiatives. And you could just write this application, it'll keep track of initiative order. Uh, so, you know, everyone rolls their dice and it just, you know, you enter in names, it gives you initiative order. And you could build a little page that does that. And that, you know, you could make a website out of it and run it on uh, a tablet at your event. You just go to the web page, you bring it up, you put in the names of the characters, you click roll initiative, you know, and you put in everybody's modifiers, etc. And, and boom, you know, like you have an initiative roller and tracker and, you know, you can build this application. It wouldn't be that complicated. And, and that's something that, you know, I think you could figure out and, and Google the pieces you don't know. Now, admittedly, the application that you build, you're not going to do it well. Like it, it, it won't be right like first time any of us build anything it's not going to be great but it will work and that's what is important and you will have learned a lot of things that are available to you once you start getting used to programming and building and using these tools that you've learned about then you can start learning how to apply them effectively um so that and and the only way that you do that is by, by writing more stuff so anyone could just spout theory and and architectures and structures patterns anything like that they can talk to you about that but it only goes so far until you've actually done it because you won't know how to apply them, when to apply them, anything like that. And the only way you do that is with experience. So write code, do it, it's fun. Uh, logical XX. Uh, <laughs> to be fair, C++ is a fantastic language that you can do amazing things with. Uh, but so, so like uh, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday about programming languages. One of the things we were talking about was um, the uh, so I, I was commenting about how uh, something I was building, oh yes, uh, some things about WPF got really, really bad and were really, really difficult. So some stuff in XAML is not easy to do and is way easier to do on the web. But some things that are really, really easy to do in WPF are really hard to do on the web. And so that kind, that this, this, these kinds of examples happen all the time. So I commented that... Um, so something in this program that we're doing here, uh, some of the data we access inside of Final Fantasy VII is stored in a, uh, a short, so uh, a 16-bit a little section, it's, it's, uh, but it's not as 8 bits and 8 bits. It's not two bytes together. It is actually 7 bits and 9 bits, which if you're running C++, it's super easy to just make a structure that just does like 7 bits and 9 bits, and you're like, yeah, no, it's that structure, what? So that's an item. And like I just made my my <laughs> my object, so I look at it, boom, cake. Uh, C sharp, you're kind of like, well, this is actually a pain, but I mean, I can do it. So that's the situation that we were in. For example, we we were in C sharp doing this, and we're like, oh, this is actually challenging. Uh, but other things that C sharp does very very well and is easy in C sharp are actually pretty hard in C plus plus. So it really comes down to which languages you're using. And the cool part is. Even if you're writing a C-sharp application, so like your GUI, you know, program is in C-sharp, it doesn't mean you can't call C++ libraries because you can. Yes, exactly. Uh, so we, we do byte shifting and things like that in here, logical. Uh, the challenge that we ran into actually is um, uh, the Indianness of the data threw us off. Um, <laughs> So that's actually what ended up ended up getting us because our brains were thinking one way and it was another way. So, um, but yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, Copper Rudy, Bob Tabor has a good C Sharp beginner series on Channel Nine, and CLW uh, from the Live Coders also does a C Sharp Zero to Hero stream on Wednesdays. Oh, that's very cool. I'm I'm glad he's doing that because I actually have not done my uh, Learn to Code series. So we we did Learn to Code in C Sharp. 
Uh, twice we've actually done those series. Once was last summer, so probably about a year ago. And then the other one was at the beginning of this year, so it's been about eight months since we did it. Um, but yes, uh, no, we are we are very pro using whatever language or technology you like. Uh, just choose the one that's good for you and run with it. Uh, we are fully supportive of all of that. Um, <laughs> we have we have no uh, we have no technology choice hating around here. Logical. <laughs> so uh, yes, if you love C go for it. If you love C, go for it. Uh, if you if you're a fan of Objective C, awesome. <laughs> Look, it's surprisingly good. Uh, you made a GitHub page last week with the links to some helpful resources. Uh, yes, I, I saw that, uh, Copper Beardy. Uh, you had a, a few people listed as well as links to the Live Coders team. Um, may I link it for the people? Um, Nightbot might yell at you, but give it a try, Copper Beardy. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're welcome to try. If it, if it, uh, if it yells at you, I'll, uh, I'll try to force it to let you send it through. No, yeah, see, it, it did yell at you. Uh, let me see if I can uh, post it now. Don't worry, Nightbot won't do anything to you. There you go. Look at that. Thanks, Brendonius, for uh, tossing it. Brendonius is actually uh, is actually the nicest mod here in the chat. Uh, also, probably the smartest and best looking of uh, of any of the moderators we have here in uh, in the Dev Chatter chat room. Uh, very very humble as well. Um, did I mention, did I mention really, really great guy? Absolutely love Brendonius. Um, uh, oh wait, that's me. <laughs> I was just kidding. I was just kidding. Uh, insert. Yeah, buddy. Uh, let me do some thing here. Uh, whoops. Derp. Seven, eight, nine. There we go. Uh, rainbow mode cost and iterations. Did I flip those? Uh, cost and iterations. There we go. I hope everyone figured out when I was saying that, you know, Brandonius was like smart and good looking and humble and everything that I am Brandonius. So hopefully everyone figured that out. That, and also figured out that I was kidding. Um, well, I mean, partially, partially, very, very. Yeah. All right, so there we go. So rainbow mode cost and rainbow mode iterations. Whoa, what? What? Did I seriously set that as the default value? Was I smoking something? Yes, I was. Oh, man. Oh, jeez. I was smoking something. Um, I don't know, 30 iterations? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we are often auto-hosting uh, Tim's channel here. Uh, Tim does a lot of streaming, actually. The, uh, if you like uh, C Sharp and Game Dev, uh, you could check out Honest Dan Games, who is a friend of ours here. Uh, Dan does stuff with uh, Unity, so because yeah, uh, that's why I was saying like figure out what you want to do because uh, you know C Sharp, for example, can be used for Game Dev as well. So yes, exactly. <laughs> If you use C++ at work all day long, it's interesting to see some C Sharp stuff. So that seems to be going. Let me adjust the settings so that, um... Wait, what? Oh, uh, whoops. That's name, I didn't, I need to name that tab correctly. So we'll set it to 10 iterations, so... All right, so there's color. So that should be one color, two colors, three colors, four colors, five colors, six colors, seven colors, eight colors, and nine colors, and then one more, and then it should go back to default. And there it goes. Okay, 
So the two takeaways from that if you were paying attention. So not only is it configurable, but the nice part is we can change it live. So I can just make that have two iterations and I can do rainbow and we should see it only do two iterations this time and then stop. And there it goes. So these changes happen as you put them in. So that's the cool thing is that automatically uh, is, is accounted for, which is nice. Uh, you don't have to like wait or refresh or anything like that. You just automatically get it. So, okay. Uh, that means that these two, rainbow mode cost and rainbow mode iterations, both have settings. So those to-dos are no longer needed. So we'll put those in there. Uh, okay, so that is uh, the settings for rainbow mode, uh, which is right there, and then that's adding that one in and doing that. Okay, so um, add settings for rainbow mode. There we go. Not bad. And for anyone that doesn't know, we are actually, uh, so the way that that actually works is we are modifying the uh, Final Fantasy VII game's memory live as it's running. So it's mildly crazy uh, that we do that. Uh, but we're actually, so funny enough, we are actually calling out to some libraries that I believe are written in C++ uh, in order to uh, make that actually happen. Uh, so... That's the funny thing is like even when you're writing C sharp you can still call C++. There's no no reason you can't. So the parts that make more sense as C++ are of course C++. All right, let's go ahead and change this so instead of Mako mode cost, we're going to have Mako mode uh, iterations uh, which we will also set to 30 by default. And we're going to scroll down to this and duplicate it because this needs to do exactly the same thing. So this will be Mako mode iterations. And instead of uh, the rainbow workload getting that, let's go to the Mako uh, workload, which is right here. And then we're gonna say, uh, ooh, right, because uh, its iterations are, okay, so here's what we're going to do, so, uh, menu settings, Mako mode iterations divided by Mako colors dot count and then plus one. So we'll always do at least one loop, but we'll then do a number of iterations that is how many colors we were supposed to do uh, that. Um, Logical, that is a fantastic question. Um, so Logical's asking if C-sharp is a compiled language or if it is interpreted. And um, the, the simple answer is yes, <laughs> uh, but I will explain. So, when C Sharp is compiled, so this code that we're looking at, clearly a computer does not actually know how to read this code. My computer only knows how to read, you know, ones and zeros, right? So binary language, that's all it actually understands. But C Sharp is still a compiled language, even though when I, when I compile this code, it does not create that. So C Sharp is compiled into what is called IL. It is, uh, called intermediate language. Um, so C sharp compiles into IL. IL is kind of like an assembly language uh, that is an assembly language that instead of running on my processor, it is designed to run in the .NET runtime. In this case, the .NET Core runtime. So the .NET Core runtime is on my computer and effectively then you could think of that as kind of like an interpreter reading the assembly language that then is going to convert that into the actual language of the computer. So uh, it's sort of the... Uh, so if you know how Java works, it's pretty much that same process. So Java does the same thing except they call their intermediate language bytecode. So 
whichever way you want to go, that's that's what it is. So you compile it into something that's really close to assembly language, so that the interpreted version, so the interpretation happens really fast. So running C# -sharp is still quick because the you know interpreted aspect of it, you can think of it that way, is going through a runtime that's basically converting from one assembly language to another. So it's not difficult. Yep, complicated question. I don't, uh, I wouldn't phrase it that way, uh, Wheat Lull. I would say that, like, you know, over 20 years ago, they, they thought that, that that was actually a good concept, and, uh, you know, companies bickered and fought, and Microsoft made one that actually worked pretty well. Um, uh, Python is just interpreted, usually. Uh, you don't, you don't actually compile that. Uh, C sharp is closer to JavaScript. Uh, just, uh, yeah, that C sharp is closer to Java, not and Python is just an interpreted language, like you know JavaScript usually is. Words, I'm speaking words. Oh, I didn't actually add the settings yet. Brendan, go add the settings. What are you doing? What are you doing, Brendan? Add the settings. Enable Mako command, enable Mako command, and then this is uh, Mako, Mako, uh, Mako, and Mako. Uh, this is 10, 10, 11, and 11. Uh, do that, and then where is Mako? Uh, enable Mako mode right here. Okay, so enable the Mako command, that's that one. Uh, so then this becomes 9. This one is eight, seven, six, five, four, and there's three. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, WebAssembly works for pretty much every language. Um, yeah, so Wheatlaw's correct. Um, yeah, so um, the short answer is, so talking about WebAssembly, um, WebAssembly is an awesome bit of technology, and it's essentially um, assembly language that runs in browsers. And so you can kind of think of that as being like the same concept as intermediate language. So C Sharp can already compile to one intermediate language. Having it compile to uh, WebAssembly is not that difficult either. So that is what Blazor is. And it's and as uh, Wheatlaw correctly points out, that is not just a huge achievement for C sharp. That is actually a huge achievement for all kinds of things, uh, because that also means that we can get C plus plus doing it. Uh, Toby, welcome, greetings. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, so, well, kind of, uh, Wheatlaw, it's, it's not, it's not, so, like, the, <laughs> we can get rid of JavaScript, like, I mean, technically, yes, that is, is one of the, one of the things that I think is a positive about it, is because right now, if you want to do web development, you are 100% required to do JavaScript. If you want to do web development, JavaScript is just, it is the only choice, and so, what WebAssembly is going to allow us to do is, instead of being forced to just use JavaScript, you could really get away with using any language you want to run in the browser. Uh, yeah, or, or transpile to JavaScript, right? At which point you're still limited by how JavaScript works. Uh, it is much nicer to, to compile down into an assembly language uh, than to compile down into JavaScript, because uh, I think you can get some better uh, stuff out of it. So, it is simpler. Visual classes and design experiences taken from Delphi. MS hired one of the cook uh, yes, yes, that is actually true. 
Um, actually, um, so, okay, so there's a funny discussion going on right now in chat about this. Um, so, uh... Here, let's just pull it up. So this is, uh, there you go. Currently works as uh, lead architect for C Sharp. This is Anders. Uh, Co-designed several popular and commercially successful programming language. Uh, original author of Turbo Pascal and the chief architect of Delphi. Uh, and he works at Microsoft as the architect of C Sharp. So yes, here you go. Kind of funny. Uh, all right, so enable the Mago command. Uh, Mago mode iteration. Mago mode cost. Enable Mago mode. Uh, I think it's gonna work. Um, let's see. Uh, for compilers, uh, as I know myself, generating bytecode is much easier than generating high-level code. Uh, yes, wheat lol, Exactly. Yes, 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 yes. So it is, it is much better, you're going to get much better compilation, much better output if you compile your C Sharp or C++ down to WebAssembly than you are if you're trying to go to JavaScript. Uh, because that is uh, much harder to go to a high level language like JavaScript. This should be much better. Uh, Mako mode cost, Mako mode iterations. That looks like it's probably right. Um, 10 iterations of Mako mode ought to be good. So there's Mako mode. Uh, and uh, it basically just looks like this little green glow down in the corner while you're playing. This is a much more subtle effect, uh, but it is kind of a cool one. Uh, logical, I have seen your uh, message. I will get to it in a second. Um, <laughs> see Mako. Ah! You win, Wheatlaw, you win. I hope someone in here got that. Other, like, I, I, I was really hoping for like a bunch of lols in the chat, but nope, we apparently don't get them. That was, that was, that was good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so nice and short now. Mako mode used to take a long time also, but yeah, you can configure it down. So that that is good. Uh, I like that. Um, did I remove the comments from the page saying that we needed to add them there? Yes, I did. Good job. All right. Uh, I'm going to catch up on chat in a second. Uh, let me make sure that... Okay, so this is add settings for Mako mode. All right, uh, logical. Uh, with with my being a professional programmer, um, you have a question for me. Uh, how is it possible that you compile assembly on your machine that runs in everywhere? Does the OS load different instruction sets and stuff? But being that the case, aren't there problems with optimizations, new processors? Okay, uh, yeah. So logical. Um, okay. Uh, I will give you the answer in in uh, the case of C Sharp. So this is actually the reason for C Sharp going to an intermediate language. So the idea is that in C Sharp, it does some optimizations just based on the compilation that are general optimizations to make the program a little bit better as it is turning that into intermediate language from the C Sharp code we write. When it does that, that IL, that DLL, can run on Windows, it can run on Linux, it can run on Mac. So this is .NET Core we're speaking of, I should specify. Um, you can still do that with Mono, with .NET Full Framework, won't worry about it. Ignore I just said that, because uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so in .NET Core, that, this code, if we have the .NET Core runtime, so that effectively means if the interpreter for .NET is on Windows with, with my system, that is optimized for windows okay and that's just how it's going to run so when we talk about uh different cpus uh you discuss what language the cpu is communicating in that's why if if you're unfamiliar with it you've probably heard of like x86 uh and x86 is you know effectively like that that's a a way of thinking of it is 
that's sort of like describing what language my processor speaks. So anybody that has an x86 compatible processor, your processor speaks, you know, x86. And that's, you know, just congratulations. If the program was compiled for that, it's going to work because that processor knows how to do it. Uh, for example, the code that, um, I believe the processors in the PlayStation were MIPS assembly. Uh, so that would be a different one. So that's one of the reasons why games don't just automatically port from a console onto the PC is because a lot of times the console's processor isn't even speaking the same language, so you can't just move it. You have to create a new version that is built for each machine it's going to run on. Uh, now that uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac, basically everybody's running on the same kinds of processors because uh, Apple switched, at least for desktops and laptop computers, it's the same. So that is the short answer to that one, which even though I was kind of long. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, yep, uh, Renee's, Renee's comment there is, is perfect. Uh, compile assembly that runs anywhere. Uh, you feel you likely need an intermediate language like bytecode. Exactly. Yep. You need you need an intermediate language uh, to do it. Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> Copper Beardy, your computer speaks blue screen. I'm impressed. Alright, uh, let's go ahead and fix the one change that I kept seeing that was confusing me the whole time we were using this. So, menu settings, name bid settings, tab header, uh, name bidding. Okay, fixed. Uh, fix name bid uh, settings tab header. Derp. That was a nice derp. I derped it. And there we go. So now if we look, we have settings for general, twitch, menu color, name bidding, command, uh, equipment, and status effects. Just to confirm over here on menu color, if I disable that, those disable, if I disable that, those disable. Not bad. Uh, let's see, and you could compile to AMD optimized code, but you need to do two compiles and distribute two applications. Yes, so Renee is correct. Um, you can do uh, like specific versions of your code. Uh, so you can you can make versions of your code that are optimized for specific systems. Uh, but if you do that, then you do have to have multiple instances of it, which most people prefer to just have the ones that could run in either. So it's it's totally up to you uh, what what you actually want to compile. There are actually a whole bunch of flags in lots of compilers, regardless of what language you're on, uh, that will do all those kinds of things. Compilers are super nice, by the way. I don't know if I've mentioned that lately. I love compilers, and the people that build them, thank you. You're wonderful. You've made, you've made programming so much nicer in so many ways. Uh, yes, exactly. Renee is correct. It only makes sense to do that in uh, in in certain cases. Yeah, there, there you go. There you go, Wheatlaw. I don't know which which language or compiler it is you work on, but but if you work on one, thanks. You make things nice. Uh, taking the situation, if we take two CPUs that are from different generations, they will have different instruction sets, right? But both do speak x64. How does that fit together, reading the same code? Um, so, they don't, they're, they're not 100% the same, but uh, by 
if they both speak x64 it is basically still going to work um you work on the compiler for your own language you made a transpiler from java to js nice wheat loan that that does work that that's that, that would qualify uh transpiler would also uh be good enough something that makes the rest of our jobs just a little bit easier all right um that's that's good uh we're all committed right good Let's pull up the task list. Let's see what's down here. Add to settings screen for materia, item, and equipment. Uh, we were working on equipment before. Repopulate. Yeah, I do need to fix that. Um, add the logger for some. <laughs> okay, yeah, so we have a few in the Seng program that I left there. Um, Settings, not the item. Okay. Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, most of the code we write doesn't need top performance. It only needs to avoid horrible from. Yes, fuel snables correct. Um, yep, yep, that is that is correct. And uh, the nice thing is, some of the the minor performance tweaks your compiler will do for you. So one of my favorite things that 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 um, people that aren't familiar with like the C# -sharp compiler uh, chime in about is if someone wrote this for loop and they wrote um, plus plus i or i plus uh, plus uh, like the the trick is that the C# -sharp compiler can tell whether or not it made a difference in the code so they look at that and they're just like wait did that matter and if the answer is it didn't matter then they just always choose the one that's ever so slightly faster and uh, a lot of other things like if a loop if you did a, a for loop for like a number of times a lot of times that'll just get straight unrolled uh, into like you know three of the three re repetitions of the code sometimes because that's a little bit faster than uh, having control flow of, of doing a go to back to the beginning essentially so um, it's all about leveling and finding optimal ways of doing it. Uh, the general compiler will avoid these non-standard optimizations of the CPU and just use the commonly agreed upon instructions. Yes, exactly, Renee. Yep, that's that's right. So it uses what matches, and um, so the x86, you know, x64, whatever you've got, it'll just use it. So you suppose you can always access CPU instructions and vector instructions. You can use Intel instructions. Uh, good evening, Simon. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, Still giving marriage guidance counseling to your two FF7 code bases. Uh, yes, Simon, we're not totally together on those two code bases yet, but we are much closer. So um, we're actually we're, we're working on the settings right now. Uh, so adding adding some of those, and this is just some more cleanup of stuff we need to do. We we fixed up the layout of our settings page in WPF and uh, made it a tabbed view kind of thing. So it's tabs inside of tabs. Not the best interface, but it works. Uh, .NET Core now supports Intel Intrinsics, so you can actually write vector-enabled code in .NET. That's really cool, Fuel Snable. Uh, when you build a Linux kernel uh, for, you can tell the compiler for your CPU as it will only run on your computer. Yeah, uh, so Renee is absolutely correct. So uh, people that are running, uh, you know, builds of Linux where they're actually compiling their com their kernel on their own computer. Uh, you obviously optimize for exactly what CPU you're using because you can, and you're not going to distribute that that build of the kernel anywhere else. So it's really cool stuff. Uh, yeah, it's not not perfect bliss yet, Simon, but they do run pretty well together. We actually have a small change uh, that I was working on that I'm not done with that I thought about doing today, but I decided to do the settings stuff instead. Um, essentially, we need to spin up Sang running in the background. Uh, so that's what I did here. Um, you'll notice I'm, I'm correctly handling the logging error, right? I'm logging this right here in case anything goes wrong. We, we have this here so that, you know... Yeah, totally logged it. <laughs> I don't think anyone believed me. Uh, so yeah, we, we've pulled a lot of stuff out of Seng, uh, so that it's like just general pieces now. Uh, and we've been able to get some to, to get reused. Actually, this would be a really cool setting to pull out. 
Um, if we pulled out that port number, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so Renee, actually the plan is to gracefully handle the error, but we are not yet. Uh, just because I haven't pulled the logger in, uh, that's really all we have to do. Um, industry accepted standard of error logging. Yes, fuel snable. Well, actually, we are logging errors all over in the rest of our application. Just right there, I haven't done it yet. Uh, so I, someone might have noticed when I had this up earlier that there was a change in app.xaml.cs, and it is that. Um, I just haven't done anything. I was just ignoring it for now, uh, just keeping the change sitting there because I knew we weren't going to be in that file. So I was like, oh, I'll just leave it sitting. Uh, so I was literally in the middle of just working on it. Uh, now it makes sense uh, for me, uh, what my code gets really compiled to and is still being able to run on other machines. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, you seldom write assembly code. Uh... Oh yeah, so fuel snable is correct. So um, I, I actually agree with fuel snable. So I do not read, uh, assemb uh, I do not write assembly code basically ever, but I do occasionally read it, and especially uh, byte code and IL. I love reading me some IL to actually see what did C sharp actually do with this thing that it ran. Like, did it did it do what I wanted it to do? I don't know. Okay, um, so we want to pull this out. So localhost, I think just the port number. <laughs> exactly, Renee. My code is fantastic. You can check the log file. There are no errors in the log file. So the code is working 100%. No errors in the log file. What do you mean your computer blue screened? I, oh, that was probably something else. What are you talking about? All right. So I want to create a Seng settings uh, because we need that. So let's take a look at the main menu, main window, and inside of here we're gonna make another tab. Making a tab, making a tab. Do I still have this? Hey, I do. There we go. Making a tab. Um, saying setting. Uh, yeah, saying. We'll just say saying. That works. And then inside of the scroll viewer, we need some stuff like um, battle settings. Is weird. I don't want battle settings. Let's take a look in Twitch settings. That's better. What's the dock panel for? Why is that dock panel there? I think I need to kill this dock panel. I don't think it's supposed to be here anymore. And I don't think we're using it. Uh, welcome, someone! Uh, Thermosa. And if I butchered your name, I apologize. Welcome to the stream. Thank you for that follow. Much appreciated. If anyone else is in here and hasn't clicked that follow button, be sure to do so, as it is the best way to get notified when we go live. Do 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 do. Scroll viewer. Uh, all right, so that would give us three things that we could put in here. So that's text box. We don't need a password box. Uh, this tab item needs a data context. Data context, and it's going to be binding. And we're going to call it Seng settings. Uh, on error, resume next. Precisely, fuel snable. That's what you do. On error, resume next. All right, so content. Um, port number. Port number. Should port number be a number box? I think it should be. Um, Uh, so it'll be be right here on grid row zero. The content of this will be um, port number. And this is going to be. Um, Port number. 
Oh, not is enabled. Um, oops. This will be port number. Port number binding two-way. Uh, increment is going to be, I guess, 10. I don't know exactly what they're going to do. Uh, minimum of zero. And we need a maximum as well. So maximum. Uh, we do not want this formatted, actually, because port numbers don't usually get formatted. Because um, you don't think of this as like a number. Uh, it happens that it is restricted as a number. Um, what is a u short dot max value? Yeah, what's the number? Thank you. Because that's the max port number, right? Yeah, that's the max port number. Uh, zero valid port number? Yeah, thanks, Fuel Stable. Uh, there might be uh, Simon, but we're going to let people choose whatever one they want. So uh, I, I don't think most people should mess with this setting, uh, but it's there if we need it. Um, so actually, uh, u short dot max value is what we would actually call logical, but I don't think, but I can't actually use it here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the size of a of a short is going to be two bytes. So yes, fuel snables correct. That's what you would get uh, logical. Um. So I need port number to be a setting on on Seng settings, which don't exist yet, so we're gonna have to make them. Application settings. Oh, wait, Seng settings exist. Sweet. Port number. Port number, port number, port number is 7777, because of course it is. Um, in the main window, we're using it there, which sadly the tools can't detect, but at least it does do it. And then inside of the app XAML, uh, no fuel snable, uh, because 7777 has meaning inside of Final Fantasy VII. Uh, if we were doing something for us, then 1337. And yes, logical, it is an unsigned short. Uh, so that's why the max value is uh, around, you know, 60, 65 instead of around, like, 30, 32. So. Um... Uh, I need to create a URI string. Um, so Uh, I don't have settings right here. I'm kind of surprised I don't have that right there.
absolute URI, I think, is the one that we want. I think that's it. Guess we'll find out if I butchered that or not. Now, the weird part with this one is because we're running it here at startup instead of running it at a later point, I think we'll require a restart in order for this to work unless we change how we initialize Seng, uh, which we can do. Okay, so application is running. Uh, if we go over to the Seng page, you'll see there's our port number specified. So the value is there. Let's go here and we'll refresh this page and hey the page is still working so I'd call that a victory right there that seems to work because when this app goes away um, that page should stop working which it does good so it was running through that so hooray we moved that to a setting <coughs> okay um, yeah, that, that I probably should have committed because that looks bigger than it is. Um, add port number as first sing setting. Alright, so now we have another setting that we can add because sing settings exist and it's memory read interval in milliseconds we created, but I don't think I'm using it anywhere. Am I? Oh, I am? Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay, uh, so let's go to the main window. Do this, and so this instead of port number is um, uh, basic memory read interval in milliseconds. Uh, row one, one, whoops. This, um, do we want a maximum? What, um, Yeah, oh, that's a good idea, Renee. Yeah, requires restart. Uh, maybe we should add that. We'll see what that looks like. Let's say you can't go below... Um, can't go below a uh, hundred milliseconds we'll say um, there we go my brain's not working so we'll do that so there we go from 100 milliseconds up to 10 minutes. Why someone would want to only check once every 10 minutes, I have no idea, but if they want to do it, we're not going to stop them. Uh, those are, so the Seng settings are ones I don't expect people to change all that frequently. Okay, so that's not like setting it to that. And then for this. Okay, it drops it back down. That's funny. Okay, that's not bad. Port number requires restart to take effect. Uh, basic memory reading. Yep, okay, cool. That works. Uh, Nearma, hey, greetings, welcome, good evening. Alrighty, let's uh, let's put that one in there as well. Uh, so that is um, 
memory read interval to settings. Great. I, I like where that uh, has actually gotten to there. I think that's pretty good. Let me click a button. Yes, the button works. Okay. I figured I would check. I am actually really thrilled with how much nicer this page is now. The uh, settings page in this app. Now the question is, what do we want to do with it? Let's take a look at the app. We'll figure out what else we want to do with this. Really tempted to put in some little features in here to just, you know, delete names and things like that, but I'm afraid of it uh, going wrong. <clears throat> Did I ever change out the uh, default setting here to be 99? Ah, uh, whoops, not that one. Um, in the name bid settings, yes, I did. Okay. <clears throat> we have default values for a lot of those, and 99 is a much better one, as someone pointed out in another uh, in another stream. To show you all a cool thing. We, we, we do fun stuff on this stream every once in a while. There was a thing that I saw that is really neat. I'm betting a lot of you saw it too. Uh, but I am going to bring it up because I think it's cool. Uh, let me click buttons. Hang on, I'm clicking buttons. I'm clicking buttons. Just give me a sec while I click buttons. There we go. What was that on the audio? So this uh, is a cool thing. We were talking about this sort of earlier in the stream. So something that came up uh, is the idea of WebAssembly allowing us to put code in the browser. So I figured I'd mention this because it's really neat. Uh, so I figured this is a fun thing to chat about. This that we're watching right here is the intro cinematic, which, you know, this is kind of, yeah, that gets kind of bad. So this is actually uh, Diablo 1. It is a, um, it's an old game from uh, 1996, came out December 31st, if I remember correctly. And uh, the... Uh, I apologize if the game's a little loud, um, but uh, Diablo is uh, is an old game, and if you notice here, this is running in my web browser here, and you might wonder, wait, how how did you get? Uh... Yeah, so Simon, I actually did the same thing uh, when I first heard about this. I loaded it on my phone and ran 
uh, Diablo 1 on my phone, which I was kind of like, you guys did an amazing job because they actually built the controls so that you can actually use, like, touch controls and click on stuff on your phone, and this is the game, and if you don't believe me, like, we can just go play the game, so I can, you know, just click through and be like, boom, this is, you know, Dev Chatter the Warrior, and, you know, click around. And I can actually just play Diablo 1. I can... Hello, my friend. Stay a while and listen. We can stay a while and listen in our browser. Uh, so what's cool about this is it's actually working... Uh, well, hang on. There we go. <laughs> Much better. Uh... Yeah, so fuel snable, uh, it's it's a funny thing, but um, to to point out that one, but the the power of it isn't that you can run a game from 1995 in your browser. The significant factor is that in theory you could put anything in there, because this shows that you could write a game. So Diablo One was not written in JavaScript, right? This is a game that uh, you know using WebAssembly you can then put this in the browser. And, and actually run the game. So this game is clearly written in something else, and we can just get it to run here. So what's neat about that is not that it's a game from 1995, but that it could be any program we really wanted. It doesn't even have to be a game. And you can pretty much just get it on here then. So that's the real power. So, and this actually probably is the original resolution right here. Actually, I have no idea if that is or not, but this very well could be the original resolution, this tiny little box up here. So, it's just kind of neat, because you, uh, you can just play this game and you're like, wait, what, really? And you're like, yeah, doesn't really require any extra work, because, I mean, it, I'm sure, took a lot of work to get it to work here, but what, but what they didn't have to do was go rewrite the whole game from scratch. So, it really is the game. You just take it and switch it over. Hello, my friend. Stay a while and listen. So, yeah, wait, yeah, you, you know, uh, Simon, I think you're gonna be waiting a while for VB6 on WebAssembly. Um, <laughs> could could be quite a long time for that one. But I figured I'd uh, show that one because it's really neat. Like, wait, what? You can just like run this? Yep, you can just run that, and it works just fine. So, really, really crazy that you can just you know bring these things on here so i mean what that means for for classic games is a lot so there's a couple of other points so in order to get around like you know any kind of issues with like oh no you're distributing the game that web browser version when you actually load it um actually why don't i do this uh can i not oh i might have had i had it in a, an incognito window so i can't bring it back up uh but anyway um they give you the shareware version of the game unless you load your own data file. So I do have a legal copy. I've got my discs over there for the original Diablo 1 game. And it was actually already installed on my computer. So funny enough, I was able to just go, oh yeah, I'll just grab my uh, file and, and put it in there and, and it runs. So it's actually quite cool. Um, Uh, not that long ago, apparently they ported Windows 95. Yeah, so Simon, I heard that same thing. Uh, so apparently you can get browsers, you can do all kinds of stuff that just running, uh, sorry, you can get operating systems and all that kind of stuff running inside of browsers. It's really, really cool uh, things that people are doing with WebAssembly. Now, how practical they all are is another story, but these, a lot of these are just proof of concept, like can we do it kinds of things. And it sort of opens the floodgates because... We could really put almost any game, it can be a modern game, it could be an old game, and we can just put those in browsers now. Uh, I mean, I think it would be an awesome uh, answer for a lot of companies. So if Blizzard officially wanted to do that, they could put all their classic games in web browsers and just let you play the classic games that way. And so you could just, you know, pay for uh, a Blizzard's, you know, Blizzard Online subscription, and you go to, you know online.blizzard.com and play all their classic games. You could go play Warcraft 1, you could play Warcraft 2, Diablo 1, and, you know, essentially any of their old properties and really just, you know, cash in on that nostalgia factor 
by just making it easy. And the nice part is, it runs on the phone. So, why not? Simon, Simon, yeah, you better run and hide. Yeah, we don't make those kinds of suggestions here. This is a family-friendly stream. You don't, you don't scare people. That is not okay. If, if one of the moderators had seen that, the ban hammer would be coming down so hard right now. You are lucky that Katrina didn't see that message. She would have been all over you. She would have been like, you know, just ban hammering like crazy. You know how our moderators get. They're very aggressive. Our, our moderators are actually very nice. <laughs> Yeah, for, first Simon mentions VB and then and then IE5, like, geez. Uh, sorry, I should say VB6, not just VB. VB is a perfectly fine language. VB6 is just a very old version of the language. Uh, we all want to run Netscape. Ye oh, yeah. Uh, are you kidding? No, I want to run uh, Firebird. Anybody else want to run Firebird? That'd be great. Uh, we all want... Uh, but the real question is, can Internet Explorer run the... Uh, do I even have, um, uh, okay, hang on, hang on, uh, We're about to find out. Uh, this is not IE. This is Edge. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Give me a minute. We're going to find out. Oh, man, it didn't even restrict me to the right kinds of files. Ah, oh, you got to be kidding me. No, get out of here. There you go. edge there you go yeah you you impressed yet oh my god it's slow and the audio doesn't work <laughs> actually the, this edge is not doing well sorry guys I'm gonna close that that was I think it was lagging running a 1995 game locally. Chrome was just like, oh yeah, we're running the audio, we're zipping around. I don't know what Edge was doing there. Uh, bringing back LimeWire in the browser? Uh, no, no, absolutely not. Max, uh, Windows for work groups on Windows? No, no, Simon, no. Firefox. You mean Firebird, Fuel Snable. I'm sure it's called Firebird. I'm sure it's called Firebird. Whoops. I can type. <clears throat> yeah. No, but that is uh, that is the power of WebAssembly. It is one of those reasons why we're going to dig into WebAssembly stuff at some point on the stream. I know we haven't done anything with it yet. Uh, I will mention that Guy Royce has been uh, probably yelling at me about that for like a good six months or so. About wanting to come on the stream and do some WebAssembly stuff with us. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to take him up on that offer. We're going to bring him on, uh, and we're going to have his bearded face way up there in the corner, and uh, we are going to do some WebAssembly stuff together because he does some awesome things, both with WebAssembly, and he also does some fun uh, machine learning stuff. Uh, so Guy is uh, is awesome, and uh, we will definitely be bringing him in for that because WebAssembly is neat, uh, and it doesn't just have to be Blazor. It can be any WebAssembly stuff. Uh, but I'm a big fan of making it so that stuff runs in cool ways in browsers because guess what? Everybody's computer and phone has a browser, so you can do some really neat things. Okay, well, uh, with that being said, I want to uh, do two things. First off, uh, I'm going to open up this uh, by clicking on these buttons. 
So, uh, I am going to have us raid over onto another stream. Uh, I should be back on Monday or Tuesday. I'm not 100%. i got to figure out my schedule. I started a new contract this week, so uh, whenever that happens, I do have to make sure that my schedule works out nicely. But uh, we should be back to streaming on Monday. Uh, we're going to do some more of this stuff then. i got to figure out what we want to do, but it should be some fun stuff. Um, we're going to bring these applications closer together and hopefully get this application, uh, so our Final Fantasy VII interactivity app, uh, ready for its first release soon. So I want to I wanna get it out the door, and then there's a lot of other cool stuff that we want to do. Uh, new contract has to look at... No, more, more like in the first week you figure out how your schedule is going to work, Fuel Snable. Uh, so some of that is uh, figuring out your schedule, making sure that, uh, that I don't need to... Uh, that, that I can get, th so it's figure out who I need to work with and when and what times so that I don't have to move my stream is really the answer. Uh, but first week, you can't always get your schedule set up the way you need to uh, in order to not mess with your streaming schedule. So that is what I will be doing there. Okay, so uh, don't go anywhere. We are going to raid people, and I want to roll our credits as well. Uh, if you are new here to the stream, first off, a couple of things I want to mention make sure that you join our Discord because that actually is a pretty good community of people. So if you're interested in chatting about cool programming stuff, that is the place I'd recommend doing it. Uh, in addition, uh, if you want to take a look at any of the source code for any of the stuff we do here on the stream, you'll find that on our GitHub over at github.com slash devchatter. And seriously, uh, you can go take a look at the code. It's actually pretty cool stuff. Lastly, I want to make sure that I mention uh, that you can find archives of our videos here in the in the video section on Twitch, or you can find all of our like 200 plus episodes of Dev Chatter over on YouTube at youtube.com slash c slash dev chatter. Links to all these things are in the chat as well as down below the stream, or if you are watching this in a recording later on, down below the video. Um, I will toss links to my uh, social media's accounts down in the bottom as well. And uh, you told them you don't ship on a Friday, right? Uh, I mean, I don't ship on Fridays. Uh, why would I ship on Fridays? So my, my short answer is I like to be able to deploy every day. I like daily deployments uh, of small amounts of code. If you are not doing daily deployments, if you're even doing like weekly deployments, I recommend those not be on Fridays. Uh, whenever I suggest that to people, they're like, well, whatever the reason is you're afraid of doing Fridays, you should fix that. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, we do work on fixing those things, so I would feel comfortable deploying on a Friday, but I'm still not foolish enough to do it if the company only does weekly deployments, because why not just deploy on another day and be around the next day in case you need to do another deployment? <laughs> but that's, that's just my stance. Either way, uh, I'm going to go ahead and roll some credits because uh, I want to make sure that I thank everybody for hanging out with us today. So, uh, Katrina, thank you for moderating, as well as Crimson Green and s &B. Uh, Always appreciated. We have some awesome moderators here in the community. I want to thank these lovely people for following the stream. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. And uh, Parsival, thank you very much for uh, the uh, Twitch Prime sub. Hopefully we'll have some awesome emotes, and uh, hopefully you do like your uh, sub badge as well. Uh, but those emotes, once they get approved, will be available to you. You can use them all over Twitch. If anyone else is interested in getting those, all you have to do is, uh, if you have Amazon Prime, well, you have a free Twitch Prime sub every month to, uh, you know, go towards wherever you want. And uh, I will see all of you on Monday. Happy coding. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And, uh, yeah. Bye, everyone. Stick around, though. We're going to do a raid. Do 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 do